in our uh, therapy practice, uh, OSI Physical Therapy, I've got a just a, yeah, I've got a great partner. He's uh, he's passionate about physical therapy. I was born to be a physical therapist. He says that multiple times a week, but. But I can always count on two or three times a week, I'm gonna get a phone call from Mike Ripley. And it's usually about 7.30 or 8 o'clock. On Fridays, it's at 10 o'clock because after the football games are over because he still covers uh, football games on the sidelines as a PT athletic trainer. So about a month ago, my phone rings and I look at it and it's like, hmm, Mike Ripley, imagine that. I wonder why he's calling me at 7.30 on a Tuesday night. You know, so I pick up the phone, what's up, Rip? And he starts talking, he says, oh man, Jim, I had the greatest experience after work today. Just the greatest thing happened. I was in the True Value hardware, and I was buying some stuff. I was looking for the stuff in the, in, the, in the aisle. All of a sudden, this guy starts running at me, down the aisle, running right up to me. He gets right up to me, and he puts his hand out, and he says, you work for OSI Physical Therapy, don't you? He said, yeah, I'm Mike Ripley. And he goes, oh, hey, wait a minute, I recognize you. Jo your name's John, right? He said, yeah, I'm John. And he said, I go to your clinic, and I see Scott Forrest. He said, yeah, I've seen you there working with Scott. He said, I just got to tell you, man, it's un the, the experience I had at your clinic was so fabulous. He said, look at this. He straightens his leg out. He bends it. He said, I couldn't do that a month ago. I couldn't straighten my knee out. And he said, okay, now watch this. Runs down, you know, here's this 55-year-old guy. <laughs> runs down to the end of the aisle. Runs back the other way. Comes back to Mike. He said... Did you see that? He said, I was running. He said, I saw that. He said, it's fantastic. And he said, well, I couldn't do that a month ago either. But because of what Scott did for me, he said, I can do all those things. And he said, it was really interesting. Scott, he said, I really connected with him. And he said, Scott always asked me, what are the two most important things that you want to accomplish here in physical therapy? Jerry, you ever heard that one before? He said, he kept focused on what I wanted to accomplish, and we worked on that. He said, now I can run and I can hike. He said, I like to hike the trails around Stillwater, Minnesota, up on the bluffs. So anyway, but he said, you know, Mike, I gotta tell you something else, a couple of things. Everybody there was so nice. Everybody was so nice to me. When I came in, they remembered my name. He said, and when I walk into a physician clinic, because he said, my dad was a physician, and I was very sensitive about this. I was looking at my watch and see how long I have to sit and wait, because my dad always said, he said, if you're a doctor, you care about people, and you don't make them wait a long time. So anyway, he says, uh, I never had to wait for more than four minutes. Everybody knew my name. Everybody was kind to me. I could tell everybody cared about me. He said, and then the other thing is, he said, in my business, he said, I tell all of our employees, we're going to have fun serving people. And this guy renovates houses in like the 10th poorest neighborhood of, of uh, Minnesota. And uh, so anyway, he said, I just saw everybody here had fun working as a team. So he said, I just wanted to share that with you. But then there's one last thing. He said, I was scheduled for knee surgery tomorrow morning at Twin City Orthopedics. And he said, last Friday I called and canceled it. And the lady I talked to said, well, you know, John, you can't cancel that surgery. You need it for your knee. Your doctor says you need it for your knee. He said, I made a decision that I don't need that for my knee because I can run and I can hike and my knee doesn't hurt anymore. So he said, you know, Mike, I just had to tell you that. So anyway, you know, Ripley's telling me the story. I said, Mike, think about it. I mean, this is an awesome story. I said, that's the triple aim. Measurable quality. Uh, Curtis um, Jones here from Photo. I said, I can imagine, Mike, that, that uh, John's photo scores were off the charts. Plus, he, you know, so um, measurable quality, an exceptional patient experience, he loved the way he was treated and cared for, and lower total cost of care. I said, Scott saved his insurance company and John at least $10,000, because that's the average cost of a knee arthroscopy uh, in, um, in the Twin Cities. So I just think that's an amazing story, and that's, that's what I do in my role. Now, I'm not a physical therapist. I mean, I'm not a real physical therapist anymore. I don't treat patients in heaven for nine or 10 years now, but that's what we sell at Therapy Partners. We sell that on behalf of our member practices and our MSO, and, and we, with the health plans, with the ACOs, with self-insured businesses, we sell that on a big scale. But the therapists deliver that every day, you know, one patient at a time.
trying to achieve the triple aim. So having said that, um, what I want to talk to you about today is the MSO model for independent therapy practices. And essentially what we do, you carve out this, what's important to you, what do you value as a practice owner? And what is the healthcare market value or demand? And where those two, where you can make those two intersect, now you're delivering value to you and your practice and you're also delivering value to the marketplace. So we, our solution is get big, but stay small. So a physical therapy MSO, management services organization, it's a defined entity. We bring strength of size and the ability to deliver value um, to independent practices and the owner of the practice maintains control. So you can get bigger, but you don't have to sell your practice. So today what I'd like to talk about, I want to tee it up for you. Before we even get to the MSO solution, I want to put it in the context of what's going on in the marketplace. So first talking about the reality and connecting what I like to call the opportunity dots because there's a lot of them out there for us physical therapists. How, is con how does consolidation, how is that going to impact your practice? The, a, big, a big change of moving from volume-based reimbursement or volume-based payments to value-based models. But then some of the obstacles in getting there, because I know we all can do this, but then we've got to get over the commodity syndrome. So I'm sure some of you in the crowd have uh, heard Jeff Hathaway talk about this at you know, different events and different, uh, uh, different presentations that he's made. And he and I have done a few of these things together. But that commodity syndrome is a tough thing to get over. And we'll talk about that. And then the challenge of change, because most people don't like change and how do you lead through that? so that you ultimately can, if you are going to make a change, if this does make sense, you've got to lead through that process and how an MSO can be a good solution for you. And I'll start out by saying it's not for everybody. Um, it's one of a few options, but it's worked very well for the practices that we work with. So um, what are the opportunities out there and how do we connect them? So these next three pages are just some definitions. So if I use a term, if I throw a term, if you're not quite sure what an ACO is or what we mean by consolidation, uh, I've got those definitions there, but I'm quite certain you know what they are. But when I, you know, the health care reform, the, the Affordable Care Act and health care reform in general, you know, the, the ACA has what, you know, thousands and thousands of pages of the law itself and rules and regulations. I mean, way more than, than certainly I can digest and I think more than any of the rest of us can too. So, but we have to deal with it. We have to deal with healthcare reform. And so we boil it down to, in, for our member practices the, within therapy partners, when we talk a lot about this, and I think it's important for all physical therapists too, eight things that really stand out for me and, uh, and, and as, as we work in the marketplace. And one is the triple aim, measurable quality and exceptional patient experience, lower total cost of care. Then there's that move from volume-based reimbursement, fee-for-service, to value-based models. That's a 180-degree change. So that's going to require a change in behavior with you as a provider and with your staff. Patient-centeredness. So both John and John talked about that this morning. Nice tie-in here. How do you deliver patient-centered care? Because that's what the market expects. Um, Say, I think in the, I'm trying to forget, I'm trying to remember which John talked about this, but you, you had several characteristics of patient centeredness and what that means. Um, and I thought that was something that I think we all should really embrace because that resonates, because that's what's meaningful to patients, but it's meaningful for the entire reform of the system. And then there's collaboration. And uh, uh, John Wolf talked about that this morning too, as I recall. And how does collaboration tie into patient centeredness? And we're going to have to learn how to collaborate with practice or with practices that might have been our competitors. I think we're going to have to learn how to collaborate with providers that maybe we haven't seen eye to eye with, if it makes sense for the patient. And then there's the whole consolidation of the marketplace. And how are you going to react to that? Can you survive when you're small, or do you have to get bigger in some way? And, and how does that all work out? But Healthcare reform is driving consolidation. Part of that consolidation is the ACOs, accountable care organizations, and they are, as the name implies, accountable. So how can you connect with them if they're gonna control a lot of where the business goes and how much you'll be paid for that? Patient-centered medical homes, another 
organization of primary care. I like to look at it as the patient-centered medical home is like a house within the uh, community of an ACO, because a good share of patient-centered medical homes are part of ACOs. And they, while they're not accountable for a total cost of care, they have costs attributed to them. And so they can either be, uh, have uh, penalties or rewards, financial rewards for you know, how costs are, uh, or, or how services are paid for across their network of providers, both in-house and outside. <clears throat> Excuse me, and then there's innovation. How do we innovate? Because the healthcare market is screaming for innovation. And they're open to that. You just have to sell your value, and how do you innovate around value? So, but now let's do a reality check. What's going on out there in the marketplace? So let's start out with costs. Uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers and Optum Health both calculated that we spent $3 trillion on healthcare in the United States in 2013. 50% of that, they estimate, was wasted. In other words, it added no value to the patients. 17% of healthcare costs are for musculoskeletal pain. It's the second biggest cost driver of, uh, second, biggest, second biggest cost driver be behind cancer in healthcare. And with respect to musculoskeletal pain, the big drivers, as I think we all can imagine, uh, surgeries, imaging, and then all the things that are, you know, the services that are related to a surgery, hospital stays, uh, surgery centers, and so forth. Okay, at the same time, there's a lot of people that don't have insurance and they don't have access to health care or they don't uh, choose to have access to health care or they can't get it. And at the same time, we have a shortage of primary care providers. So what does the market want? Given these situations, what, does the mar what is the market screaming for? Well, the Affordable Care Act and commercial health. One's the government, one's capitalism, and they're both screaming for the same thing, change. We've got to change because it's not sustainable as it is. We need better access to care. More people have to be insured, okay? We must lower the total cost of care because we all pay for that. Providers have to deliver value and providers have to be willing to share financial risk. So think about that for a second. You've got all these dots up here, all these realities going on. So how does physical therapy fit in? Well. I think it fits in beautifully in that we've got a lot of evidence that shows physical therapists drive down total cost of care. And if you want any of those studies, send me an email. I'd be glad to send you the ones I've got. We use them all the time. We, use the, we reference them with health plans. We reference them with the ACOs. We reference them at 3M when we work over there. Early access to good physical therapists drives down costs. Physical therapists get great outcomes. You use a tool like Photo, now you can prove it. We do that, we sell that within therapy partners, a lot of practices do, but physical therapists can get great outcomes with their patients. And physical therapists can serve as primary care. U.S. military, every branch of the military, physical therapists are primary care for musculoskeletal pain. Kaiser Permanente in California, certain physical therapists are primary care for musculoskeletal pain. So now you think about that, now you can start connecting dots. And for all those problems, for all those situations, good physical therapists can be a solution. So well-managed, well-marketed, effectively sold physical therapy can be a solution for the woes that ail us in healthcare. And I just don't think, I think a key there is effectively sold. I don't think we do enough to sell the value of what we do to these powerful decision makers that are out there, including patients. But we do a good job with them. But, you know, when you get to the health plans, the ACOs, self-insured businesses, you know, we've got to get out there and sell because we've got a great product, and that's opportunity. And we've got a great opportunity. We just have to seize that. So here's some articles in case anybody's interested in them. Uh, contact me. I can email you the PDFs. And there's more out there. But I do want to share with you um, uh, some, I don't want to call it a study, but we've done a few pilots with, with some uh, uh, therapy uh, networks in some other states. And, you know, if you think you can't get data from a health plan, you know, not that they're going to give it away on the first ask, but if you don't ask, they won't give it to you. But we've gotten total cost of care data 
from two health insurance companies, one big one, one really big one in the Northeast, and one medium-sized one in the Northeast. We've gotten total cost of care data from a health plan, a medium-sized health plan in a southern state. And we got a ton of data from a big work comp third-party administrator in a state just north of us here. And they serve, uh, I mean, work comp carriers uh, in, in the multi-states here in the upper Midwest. And they gave us data on physical, th our costs on physical therapy, surgeries, MRIs, medications, hospital stays, you name it, all the costs related to musculoskeletal pain in which the patients had physical therapy. And we got it for anywhere from 19 to 21 months. And so we'd usually start with um, six months prior to the start of physical therapy, all the way to, anywhere to about a year after physical therapy was completed. We call them, and I heard uh, John uh, Vakovic uh, talk about this today, about upstream and downstream costs. So we called the upstream costs anything from the first data service, the first, first intervention, the cost of that, all the way through the end of physical therapy. Physical therapy cost was from the evaluation to the last visit. And then the downstream cost was anything that happened after physical therapy was discontinued. So here's a, the first one. Let's see here. The first set of data was from that southern state. And you can see 50% of their total costs were upstream. In other words, it occurred before our physical therapy was completed. If you compare that to the one right below it, which is from a, a northeastern state, there was only 40%. So, okay, why was that difference? Well, the more we dug into it in the southern state, very common, much more common people had, you know, musculoskeletal pain or an injury, they went to an orthopedic surgeon first. So they entered the cost funnel at the highest price service. Okay, physical therapy, you look at that was uh, actually, the top one is wrong, it was supposed to be 35%, um, was the physical therapy cost, and in the northeastern state it was 30%. You know, if you just look at that in isolation, if I'm a health plan, I'm thinking, man, I gotta do something to drive down physical therapy costs because, man, that's, that's a lot, that's gotta be a lot of money. But if you start breaking it down into total costs, so let's just say in that southern state, that that, that the, the average total cost of an episode of care was $2,000. In that northeastern state, and I'm making these numbers up, they're not the actual ones, but, but uh, not too far off. In, that, in the northeastern state, it was $1,500. Okay, why was there that difference? And so we, we talked to them, we talked about different ways we could do that. We did a pilot in one of those states, and we found that the physical therapy with just using photo and the therapists who manage their care around that, trying to get good outcomes, and that was just for one segment of musculoskeletal pain, uh, shoulder pain, that co total costs were reduced by 20%. So I think it's very, um, you know, and, and uh, John talked about this day too, what if he could move physical therapy up? You know, a lot of you on Twitter, uh, you know, um, what is it, hashtag P PT first, whatever. Um, if we can get more people walking through our doors first, I have no doubt that 20% reduction in total costs is a reality. I think that's very realistic. And if, if we can do this, now you can sell your value to high or to powerful decision makers because now we can move them from thinking about physical therapy as a cost center to be a value driver. And they're starting to listen. But only 7% of people, this from Optum Health, you know, from United Health Group, only 7% of people across the country with musculoskeletal pain access physical therapists. So now th think about all those dots that are out there and what you do and what you could do. What if that was 14%? What if it was 21%? I don't think you'd worry about your competitors down the street. I think you'd wanna work together because your biggest problem is gonna be finding enough really good physical therapists to take care of these people. And I think that's doable. And we're starting to see some changes. So those are the opportunities. Now let's talk about some of the challenges. Consolidation. For every action, there is a reaction. And I know you're seeing it in the marketplace. But what, is, what does consolidation really look like? And you can recognize it in your marketplace because it usually starts with hospitals. So in a hospital, you, let's take a community and you've got two hospitals. They're about the same size. They don't, they're nothing special about one more than the other. And they get paid the same reimbursement rates from the health plans. 
Okay, now we've got, let's just say, seven, in the, or seven primary care clinics out there, all about the same size, some a little bigger, some a little bit smaller, but they don't negotiate their contracts either, and they all get paid about the same. Now we've got a couple of GI clinics, okay? GI docs, there's not a lot of them out there, you know, supply and demand. And, uh, you know, they've got a little clout. But the, the bigger GI practice, they make twice as much as the smaller one because they've got more docs generating revenue and they've got the strength to negotiate a better deal with Blue Cross or whoever they're negotiating with. And we take, let's take some orthopedic practices. Okay, same thing. Little one, medium sized one, big one. The big one makes more money, better contracted rates, and more volume. And then we've got the physical therapists. You know, a lot of them out there. Most of them don't. Very few physical therapists negotiate their rates. And so they all get paid about the same. So they all look real similar. But when consolidation occurs, it typically starts right there. Those two hospitals come together. And why do they come together? Because they can negotiate, they've got negotiating strength with these powerful health plans. And if, there, if, if there's a battle between a health plan and a hospital in the Twin Cities of Minnesota, three million people in the Twin Cities of, uh, of Minneapolis, St. Paul, and their suburbs. When Fairview Health System got in a battle with Blue Cross and it made the front page of the Star Tribune, Minneapolis Star Tribune and it made the front page of the St. Paul Pioneer Press, who's the bad guy? Well, it wasn't Fairview because it was all about what are these people going to do for their health care? You know, and so Blue Cross didn't like that. Five days later, they signed a deal and Fairview got what they wanted that they can make more money. But now, now, you can really, now they're really getting smart. They buy all those primary care clinics. And now they're making even more money. And now they're more profitable. And now they're more powerful. And they negotiate better rates. And they, in fact, they bought those seven cl clinics. They opened up three more. And they start providing more services and more services. You know, you've got the GI docs. They're still sitting up there. They're watching, gosh, look at what's happened with our hospitals. I was talking to the hospital administrator, the CEO of the hospital the other day. He said, man, they got, they, they're making more money now because they came together. And the orthopedic surgeons, you know darn well they're talking. They're, they're watching this too. So what do they do? They do the same thing. Now they merge. They come together. And it's all about bringing supposedly more value to the market, but it's all about negotiation strength. And so that orthopedic group that was making the most money, the biggest one, now the little one and the medium-sized one come together, now they get paid more because they've negotiated a better rate. And then you've got the physical therapist in back, okay, what are we gonna do? Well, what we did is we came together as an MSO. We didn't feel like merging. We, no, none of us had enough money to buy each other out or anything, but we came together as an MSO, and that created some strength of size for us. I put a whole lot of dollar signs up there just to impress you. Um, in reality, it's fewer than the orthopedists make. In this crowd, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll brag that it was a lot, but it really wasn't that much. But who's really driving consolidation? It's these guys right here. United Health, Blue Cross, or Anthem Blue Cross, and uh, Cigna. Stop it, come on. Okay, and um, Aetna Humana. Okay, so they've gotten big. I mean, three health plans across the country. So for every action, there's a reaction. The more, whenever you see somebody consolidate, somebody else is going to do it right after that. So that, you know, you hope on paper, you hope that consolidation in the market is going to bring value to patients. Um, questionable, probably doubt, doubtful. But the real reason people consolidate, the organizations consolidate, is to get negotiating strength. So here's what it looks like up in our, you know, up in Minnesota, nice. So when, when Jerry comes to town, the Minnesota nice takes a little hit, you know. Because <laughs> they think he's from Minnesota because he wears his twins baseball cap when he's up there. So anyway, so we've got four health plans in, that cover the state. You probably only recognize one, Blue Cross Blue Shield. The others are local. Minnesota's a little weird in the sense that uh, there's a state law, and I think it's the only one in the country, but health insurance companies uh, have to be not-for-profit. Yeah, that's appropriate, okay? So notice that, there's those four. Um, then we've got, uh, oops, 
We've got four ACOs in the Twin Cities. Uh, and 87% of the primary care doctors work for the ACOs. There used to be five. Health Partners, HP, Park Nick, Health Partners, Park Nicollet. Uh, up until a year and a half ago, that was two ACOs. Park Nicollet in Minneapolis, Health Partners covered St. Paul and St. Paul suburbs and into western Wisconsin. They merged. So now they cover the whole Twin Cities. Alina, that's the biggest one. They cover the whole Twin Cities. Okay? And, um, but, but take notice, too, that Health Partners is a health plan and Health Partners is hospitals and clinics. Vertical integration. So they're perfectly aligned for health care reform. Um, outstate Minnesota, there's four ACOs. I won't go into that. And in the Twin Cities, this is, I think, the most inter interesting thing here. There's three orthopedic practices. There used to be nine. They've all merged to three. Twin City Orthopedics was a uh, Minneapolis company. St. Croix Orthopedics, St. Paul company. They came together three months ago as Twin City Orthopedics, covering the entire Twin Cities. 110 doctors. 110 doctors in one orthopedic practice. But you know what? The St. Croix Orthopedics doctors, when they were acquired by Twin City Orthopedics, they got a pay raise because Twin City Ortho got $1,200 for an arthroscopy. St. Croix, who had a bad CEO and didn't negotiate very well, they got 9000 But when they came together with TCO, rates went up. So here's our therapy partners. We've got uh, 14 practices, all owned by different people. We, therapy partners doesn't own anything uh, in those practices, although we could, I suppose. If they wanted us to, we could buy into them, but I've uh, chosen not to. Uh, and there's 29 clinics now. We've got a couple more coming on board. So that's what consolidation looks like. You know, is that a good thing or is it a bad thing? I think time will tell. But uh, another big change to moving on to this is the whole revolution around how do we get paid, you know, in volume or value-based services versus volume. So a volume equation would be you find a, and, and this is how a health plan looks at it. This is what they assume everybody's doing. You take a profitable service, whatever that might be, you try to get as much of a fee attached to it as you can, and then you do it as often as you can. Maximize your revenue, do more. And they're always going to assume that's what providers do. And that creates a conflict. So the providers and the, and the health plan are at odds because the health plan wants to drive down um, volume, and the providers supposedly want to increase volume. And who usually wins that battle unless it's a hospital system? It's usually the payer. But now let's look at a value equation. Now you take quality care, convenient access, caring service. That should be service, not services. Caring service. Like John, in the example I gave, like John got at the front desk at OSI Physical Therapy in Stillwater, Minnesota. Then you divide that by total cost of care. So now that's consumer value. So in, in value-based methodologies, payment methodologies, it's about doing it better and being rewarded for that. And it's really about the triple aim, measurable quality, an exceptional patient experience, and lower total cost of care. So if you look at that, I mean, who can argue with that? That appeals to a patient, very patient-centered, should appeal to us as providers, it should appeal to the health plans. Now we're in alignment. And ideally, you know, and this takes work and it doesn't just happen overnight, but now providers and plans can work together to maximize patient value. Okay? Deliver services that improve patient health and reduce total costs. Good for the patients, right? Are good for the health plan, right, if you're reducing costs. And then reward those providers who do well, and that's good for the providers. And, uh, you know, it takes a while to get there, but we've certainly seen it in our market. We've certainly seen it in our market where um, that the health plans are paying for value, and if they're not, now, 2015, 2016, Blue Cross and Medica, the other two big payers and preferred one, have said, we're ready to do it in 2017. But you got to get out there and sell it. So now here's one thing I would take with you. For those of you, you know, entropy is a little different. You know, your business model is different. But if you're working with health plans, if you're working with a health plan, this came right from a good friend of 
Jerry's and mine, Richard Zhao. And if you're on Twitter, follow this guy because he knows the dark side, you know, the other side. He worked for Optum Health for three years. Richard, He's a nice guy. great guy, brilliant guy, brilliant guy. But he said, you know, we met with him one day. He said, Jim, it's not that hard. It's not that difficult. He said, I crunched data at Optum Health on musculoskeletal pain, physical therapy, primary care, chiropractic, orthopedics, all of that stuff. And he said, he said, take a funnel and turn it upside down. Okay, the top of the funnel now, that's primary, that's office visits, primary care, physical therapy, chiropractic. He said, it's cheap stuff, inexpensive. And again, he's coming from Optum Health, owned by you know, United Health Group. He said, but where things start getting really expensive is when those patients enter the wide part of the funnel. And he said, it goes like this. They get, and, and you know this, they get an MRI, and the MRI always shows there's something wrong. So now they gotta do something else. So how about an injection, okay? They found that those don't help that much, you know, in the grand scheme of things. So now what's the next option? Well, I guess it's time for surgery. And that's when United Health and Blue Cross and the plans out there, they start spending their money when it gets into that high cost of the funnel. So they like to see people walk into the low cost part of the funnel, you know, do some cartwheels out of your clinic, go back to playing basketball, whatever it is, but keep them out of that, the, the wide part of this funnel here, because that's when they're gonna spend the most money. So I asked him, I said, Richard, so if that's the case, why does Optum, United Health, I mean, these guys are the biggest scoundrels out there, why don't they pay physical therapists? He said, well, that's real easy too. He said, we want people to stay in physical therapy, we want people to go to primary care, we like people to go to chiropractic, we don't want them to go to orthopedic surgeons because they cost a whole lot more, but we do want to, he, we, he said when he worked for them, the health plan wants to keep people in, you know, below that blue line because the patients pay for all that and they don't start spending any of their money until they get up to coinsurance. So if we can pay providers like physical therapists less, they stay down low longer and then they don't have cost. And he, he said, Jim, it's also very simple. If physical therapists would come in and walk away from deals, and he's big about that. He said, if you walk away from a deal, they gotta listen to you. If you've got enough of you there, if it's just one or two of you, they can probably do without you. But he said, physical therapists do not come in and negotiate contracts, so we know we can just give them whatever we want to. So I think those are some realities of the marketplace in terms of the whole move to value-based models. Here's some data, uh, the American, uh, health insurance plan, it's, in, uh, it's not really a health plan, it's more of a, a data organization, as I understand, out of Seattle. And they say that 90% of payers and 81% of hospitals have a mix of value-based reimbursement and fee-for-service. And they expect fee-for-service to decrease from 56 to 32% uh, over the next five years. So it's moving towards value. Blue Cross Blue Shield has spent $65 billion on upgrading their technology to be able to handle to make that move from fee for service to value based, Optum Health or not Optum, uh, United Health Group has spent 43 billion with a B, and then Aetna. I read uh, recently on Fierce Health that their their CEO said they expect to pay that uh, in 2015, 30 percent of their payments to providers will be on value based models. So what's the solution? Um, here's how we go about it. Uh, we have to connect with the powerful decision makers. How do we do that? We create a mission around the triple aim. We create a culture around value. So the triple aim, measurable quality, exceptional patient experience, lower total cost of care. The only way you can do that though is if you have a culture that supports that. And a culture around value, around measuring your outcomes and that that's important. That's how we do our business, about patient centeredness, about collaboration, about managing our care well. Now we can start to innovate and come up with strategies that are gonna be meaningful to those decision makers. Whether it's getting bigger, or new care models, or new, new services, or new, uh, you know, a new way, a new, a new reimbursement model. But innovate so that you can connect and speak the same language as the powerful decision makers. But you have to have a culture to support that. Apply that to connecting the dots, but now we've got a few obstacles to get over, and one is the commodity syndrome. And a commodity means that the only thing that matters is cost. Value, or quality is not a factor. 
So how do we get there in physical therapy? Because we are there. I think it's six things. There's been a long-standing combative relationship, you know, between payers and providers, and we typically lose. Okay, plans, payers have a silo mentality. Let's control the cost of physical therapy. We won't worry what happens downstream from that. And they, and they get locked down on that. High-profile providers get all the attention, so they're going to put their attention on orthopedists and hospital systems and so forth, and we get pushed to the back burner. And it's kind of like, you know, if you're a basketball player and you've got the best team in the conference, you know, and, and there's the second and third best teams there and you're focused in on them, then there's that team you beat by, by 35 points every time you play them. Pretty soon you just forget about them. And you don't even prepare for them. Okay. Fourth, few physical therapists either can or are willing to negotiate. And they don't walk in and negotiate with the health plans. And when they get a crummy contract, very few physical therapists walk away from those deals. And so they keep getting them thrown at them. And then lastly, you know, physical therapists in general just haven't come to health plans with a lot of innovation. They come, you know, shaking a tin cup, I need more money. But we need to go there with innovation that brings value in a win-win deal. Okay, so here's the way we look at it. Understand so how we go about it when we meet with a health plan. I try to understand their problem better than they do. And let's just say, let's make it real simple. They're spending too much money. That's their problem. That's what they think their problem is. But respect their interests. And the interests of a health plan, in most cases, are silos. So if you, they're talking to physical therapists, their interests, how do I get the cost of physical therapy down? But we try to move them away from the interest to what their needs are. The needs of a health plan are not to reduce the cost of physical therapy because it's low cost. You saw it up there in that cost funnel from Optum Health, the biggest healthcare data repository in the world. Their interests are to reduce total cost of care. And now we have to come up with a solution that meets that. And then once you get them to buy into that, now you've got to keep producing. You've got to exceed their expectations. And we did that using photo with Health Partners Health Plan. But we met with them every quarter with their executives and they asked, how's it working? We tweaked it. We modified it. And every time we went back there, they said, boy, this is really great stuff. And so we went beyond what they expected. And in fact, we lowered their cost because they stopped doing utilization review for physical therapy because they said, looks like you guys manage it well enough yourself. So we exceeded their expectations and saved them even more money. And now you're a valuable resource. So, but it's easy to sell that, but if you sell it, you've got to deliver that value, and change is hard. Change is really hard. Most people don't like it. They're looking for leaders to help them guide them down the path. They're looking for managers to help them problem solve and get there. But this came for, for those of you uh, that like to read. I know there's a number of you in the audience that do. Um, Managing Transitions by William Bridges. Easy read, but talks about how do you deal with change. And he found through studies, 5 to 10% of people hate change so much they're going to try to make it fail. Uh, 15 to 20% hate change so much they're going to try to, or they're just going to resist it. So you've got, what, 20 to 30% of people in any organization are going to really get in your way. Okay? Now you've got kind of the unwashed in the middle of the 30, 40%. You know, they're adaptable. And they say, yeah, whatever, I'll do it. Just tell me what to do. But they don't quite understand. And it takes your time as a leader to get them on board to where they really embrace it and they're your champions. So now you've got 50 to 70% of the people in an organization that take a leader's time to work through change. And so now the good news is you've got 15 to 20% of people who embrace change and you've got 5 to 10% of people who are going to be your change champions. So when we implemented photo across therapy partners, every clinic had to have a ch photo champion to make sure that they helped the leaders of the practice make it work. Because if you don't get the rank and file, the guys in the trenches making it work, it doesn't work. So I just want to say, if you're going to succeed with all this stuff here, you have to know how to lead. You know how to, have, know how to engage your team and build a high-performing team. So, with that as a backdrop, now I'll share with you what we feel a good solution is. At least it's worked well for us, and that's our Therapy Partners um, Management Services Organization. So I, I think, you know, as you think about it, you own your own practice. There's all this stuff going on, all these things we've talked about here for the last 45 minutes. What's going on in the marketplace? 
I think, you know, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but I think there's really four options that physical therapy practice owners have. One is just to stay the course. I can do this on my own. I've got my niche carved out. I've got patients coming in. I get a few more every year, make a little bit more money every year. I'm really valued by my clients and I can make it and it works because you've differentiated. But what if you say, gosh, I'm not a whole lot different than everybody else out there. I treat necks, I treat backs, I do sports, I do extremities. You know, there's tons of physical therapy practices out there. I'm watching this market consolidate. I got to get bigger. And so you can grow your own. Um, Larry Benz, you know, Confluent, TexPT, the North Carolina group, the Indiana group, the, the Kentucky group came together as Confluent. People like Larry have the, the money, the, the financial um, ability to access capital and the business knowledge to pull that kind of thing together, but n not a lot of us do. So it's hard to grow your own and it's expensive. Okay, another option is, and we're starting to see this, and this is why I think this is relevant here. A lot of physical therapy practice owners, there's panicking, there's fear setting in, oh my God, it's, I gotta sell. You know, and there's plenty of people out there ready to buy. You know, but that's a tough decision, you know. I've worked all these years to build a culture, to build a quality, to build a brand. And once you sell, it's not your brand, it's not your culture anymore, it's whoever you sell to. And then we feel like we bring a fourth option. And I think it used to be a little broader here. You know, we say the MSO, that's where you can get big and stay small. It's where you own your own practice, but you're part of a, a bigger system under one tax ID number for contracting. Used to see networks here, IPAs. You know, with my experience working with health plans in multiple states and listening to them, they're just, they don't have a, I mean, go back to the whole ACO, accountable care organization. If you're loose knit, there's no accountability there. And it's just hard to hold people accountable if they're not part of something that's tied together. So there's some options. And uh, I'm gonna leave the first three aside and I'm gonna talk about option number four. So what is an MSO? Okay, it's an administrative and contracting entity that tightly integrates therapy practices. However, the practice owners get to continue to own and run their businesses. Okay, through the single tax ID number, it creates efficiencies and economies of scale, creates strength of size to negotiate better rates and to get a seat at the table with the health plans because you're representing more, more providers, more clinics. And it provides billing, technology, administrative services, any of a brand, marketing, all kinds of other sort of, kind of depending on how you're organized, you can do a lot for the practices. And an MSO is a defined business entity that brings the practices um, an ability to reduce their costs, an ability to, um, um, through the strength, get better rates uh, from the health plan, through outcomes management to create value-based models because you can hold everybody accountable. It provides owners with practice management tools uh, and it offers the, the practices and their teams professional development, clinical, leadership, et cetera. So the, the MSO allows our member practice owners to focus on their business, get better and better at delivering care, at building relationships in their community with their patients, referral sources, and to grow their businesses. And they kind of leave this other stuff behind the scenes to therapy partners or to the MSO. And we've got six real guiding, I don't want to say principles, but kind of that drives our decisions. Um, one is that we feel real strongly that the best decisions are made, the, the closer those decisions are made to the therapist and the patient, the better the decision. On the flip side of that, the farther the decisions are made from the patient and the therapist, the more those decisions are all about money. We feel that independent practices are aligned the, the absolute best to build relationships and to deliver value. However, it's just hard to get your foot in the door unless you're part of something bigger. It's just hard to get some of the decision makers, decision makers attention um, if not, or if you're not big enough. And um, we have to build trusted relationships with those powerful decision makers, uh, the, you know, the plans, the ACOs, and then we must deliver value 
We have to have expectations for all of our providers and we have to be able to hold them accountable. So those are really what guides us. And when we bring a practice on, we're very selective. We're not just taking any and all comers. So we go through a vetting process, interviews, um, questionnaires are filled out. We've got an advisory board. So it's not just we want to get bigger just to get bigger. We want to get bigger to get better. So Therapy Partners brings value to the practice owners, to the health plans, and yes, to our patients, you know, through quality care, quality outcomes, and delivering on the triple aim. So just to give you an idea, how does this look to a, to a health plan, especially, you know, a payer, whoever's paying the bills, but a, an ACO may look at it this way too. So in, a, in an independent market, it's very complex. You know, all those lines add complexity, and all those lines add cost. So you're contracting with a bunch of independents. You're taking their claims in, you're dishing payments out. What we do with therapy partners, or with an MSO, now you slide in the middle. You slide in the middle and we do the work for the health plan. We get the contracts, all the claims come into therapy partners through our billing system, they all go out to the health plan, and all the payments come back to therapy partners. And then we distribute the money to the practices. We simplify things and that adds value to the plans. And so they're willing to pay us a little more. And then there's the inconsistency thing. You've got costs, outcomes in an independent world because there's no accountability kind of across a broad you know, range of providers. There's inconsistency in outcomes, if they even measure outcomes, and in cost. So what we do again in an MSO, you slide in the middle, you set expectations, you use an outcomes tool, you do training, you manage that process, you hold people accountable, and now you can deliver a predictable product, a predictable service to the health plan or to the ACOs. And that brings value to them because health insurance, any kind of insurance is all about predictability. So that's how we deliver the value. Now just a little bit about us personally. What's our why? For those of you who've read Simon Sinek's book, you know, start with why or watch his eight minute YouTube video, how how uh, leaders inspire people to take action. Okay, our vision is to grow our MSO in Minnesota, Wisconsin, but you know we're poised, we'd like to go into some other states as well. And to be able to serve those clients, bring them size, bring them efficiency, bring them strength, bring them stability so that they can own their practices for years and years to come. Our mission is to reduce the operational costs of our members, to improve their reimbursement, manage financial risk, and um, uh, provide practice management solutions, provide learning opportunities, and to deliver triple aim value. Uh, so the next stuff here is more kind of just information about us. I'm just going to breeze through this stuff, um, and including our services. And I'll just kind of hit the highlights. We, do bill, we have a centralized billing office. We do all the billing, AR management, payment processing. All the payments come into our office every day, electronic and paper, and we've got people that process those payments and reconcile them, and it has to balance to the penny every day for every practice because all those payments are posted into the same system. The practice owners can look online every day to see how much money we collected for them. We send them their money every Friday morning, and everything has to balance, and we can't miss a day, we can't miss a beat. So that's probably the biggest uh, challenge, but once you get the process down, it does, it kind of works like clockwork if you have the right people who are very disciplined. Uh, we do contracting. Uh, providers can't, the practices can't opt out. They're either all in or they're all out. So it's not like an IPA or a network. It's like, oh, I'll take this one, but not this one. It's against the rules. And uh, that would destroy the value of our MSO if they were able to do that. Uh, we do credentialing compliance. Uh, we do uh, value-based modeling, photo training, photo management, we, uh, clinical education, leadership training. We put a high emphasis on leadership and team building. Uh, so that's kind of the way. We, we developed a software called the PT Manager. We give that out to the practices so that they can look at their metrics, you know, for productivity metrics and as well as cost metrics, performance metrics or performance assessment, uh, followership, leadership, high performance team and performance reviews. And then we have a project manager aspect of the PT Manager too. So, uh, and we support efforts to learn to prepare for OCS and SCS and so forth. So, um, I do, one last thing before I'll stop and then open up for questions. Uh, a couple things. We charge our members based upon a percentage of collected revenue. So they pay us a percentage of what we collect for our minus, minus reimbursements. 
or uh, yeah, uh, not reimbursements, but uh, um, what word it starts with an R? Paying people back when they overpay. Um, so we that's that's and and they're all a little bit different. The practices that have been with us since 1999 have a little bit lower rate. The ones that are coming on a little later have a little bit higher rate. And then we provide different services that some buy and some don't buy. So we always have some required service and some optional. Um, we have a we have a value-based model with Health Partners Health Plans, the biggest health plan in the Twin Cities, 1.35 million covered lives. We've Photo's been our valued partner with them. We approached them in 2009 to do it. They said, ah, I don't know if we want to do this or not. We approached them again about three months later. Ah, I'm not really sure if we want to do it. And then about six months later, they called us up and said, hey, we're just wondering if you want to do that, a pilot using photo, and we want to see if that makes a difference. And they said, if you're willing to do this, we'll pay you more. But the model is they pay us a per diem rate. They gave us a real nice raise, and then they threw another little bit on top of it as a bonus. And then they withheld a certain percentage of that that sat in a big warehouse someplace for a year, you know, kept accumulating. And we could earn that back based on our photo outcomes. And we set benchmarks. Very collaborative. We worked with them every quarter. We had the benchmarks set like up here, and we got three-fourths of the way through it, and we thought, there's no way we're going to do this. It's never going to work. And so they said, you know what? Okay, let's dial it back. Dennis Hart from Photo was awesome, the, the late, great Dennis Hart, who we miss dearly. But he helped them get through that to say, you know what? You're being unfair to these providers. So, uh, and it's worked very well for us. We've gotten between 86, I believe, 80, 84 and 100 percent of our bonus back every year. And, uh, and only one year was it in the 80s. It was 84 percent one year, and every other year it's been 96 to 100 percent. So it does work. Uh, and we're ready to take it to the next level after this. Questions, comments, uh, I'd be happy to try to answer them. Who owns the MSO? Uh, the MSO is owned by uh, Craig Johnson and me. And Craig Johnson's a physical therapist. Some of you might know him. He's the president of the Minnesota chapter, and Craig's been in private practice for a long time. So. Um, Jim, uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, how you how you develop kind of a common culture, I guess, in the MSO? Well, that's a good question. It hasn't been easy. You know, we started in 1999, and uh, the first uh, the first six years there wasn't too much controversy. Then all of a sudden, things started changing in the marketplace. We had to make some internal changes. Our executive director left. It's kind of some controversy around that. And then we had a change of ownership. And uh, a few of us bought therapy partners from the whole. Used to be, it was owned originally by all the practice owners. And then some of us bought it from everybody. And that created a little bit of a conflict. Once we did our, this thing I was just talking about with health partners with a value-based model, that brought us together. Because we sat down and said, you know what, guys? This is a team effort. Because it's not like this practice is going to earn this bonus and this practice is this bonus. The bonus came to therapy partners, and we divvied it up based on volume of patients that they had seen. So working culture, we, since 2011, we've really worked hard at that. And we do it through leadership. We do it through team building, through coursework, you know, collaborating between the clinics. You know, even if, you know, we've got one clinic or two clinics that are, Five miles apart, owned by two different practice or two different or two different practices. So, it is a challenge, though. It takes a lot of time and commitment. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Thank you.